Well, good morning. Uh, today we're. Uh, oh, this works better. Right here. Well, it's not on. Uh, that's better. Uh, we're going to continue our journey in Galatians today. We're going to be in Galatians chapter two. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can uh, turn there. Galatians chapter two. Yesterday uh, we considered the purpose or the primacy, the power and the purpose of the gospel, right, as, as Paul begins this letter. So as we come to chapter 2, uh, we're going to pick up in, in verse 11 in just a little bit. As Paul's writing to the, the churches in Galatia, uh, in the beginning of chapter 2, he, he moves on in his story to about 14 years after his conversion. He talks about a time that he went up to Jerusalem uh, and just talked about the issue of the fact that People were struggling, the Jewish people were struggling with how someone can come into God's family. Because for them, it had always been that you had to become Jewish, that you had to enter the covenant of Abraham, that you had to, men had to be circumcised. And so there was a tension going on because Jesus came, yes, as the Messiah, as the Savior of the Jewish people, but he came as the Savior of the whole world. He came for Jew and for Gentile, and for, for many that was hard for them to accept and hard for them to understand. But for Paul, he was passionate about this because he knew that the only way now into God's family was one way, and that way was Jesus. And so Paul had a passion for everyone to come into God's family through faith in Christ. And so he talks about that in chapter 2. In fact, he was with Titus, and he talked about how they were spying out his freedom, and all of these things. And so now, as we come to verse 11, Paul is going to be back in Antioch, in his, in his home church, in his home area. And we're actually going to see that Paul is going to have to confront Peter. right? And so we're going to see a confrontation about this issue with the gospel. And then Paul's going to share a little bit of his testimony in chapter 2 that I'm excited for us to get to. But again, remember, Paul... He was a man of the law. He was a Pharisee. He was somebody who took God's law very seriously. But Paul had come to know, once he came to know faith in Christ, that he realized that the law had never changed his heart. Because the law didn't have the power to change the heart. The law only merely pointed out his need for a Savior. And Paul will argue with that later in the book of Galatians. We'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. But as, as Paul is... is is, is writing about this encounter he's going to have with, with Peter, it, it, you can see his passion. Right? We talked about Paul being passionate yesterday, right? And for, for Paul, this issue is so personal, so near to his heart. It's life and death. It's an eternal issue. And so he wants to make sure that the gospel remains clear, that the Galatian believers that he's writing to would not drift away from or be pulled away from the gospel. And they, in fact, were being pulled away from the gospel. Right? And so Paul is going to share this confrontation with them that he had with Peter. Now, how many of you would say, I like confrontation? I'm always ready for an argument or a fight. All right. Take note, counselors. All right. Now, how many of you would say, I run away from confrontation as fast as I can get? All right. A few more of you. All right. Some of us, and I would consider myself that way, I, I don't like confrontation. Right? I, I don't like it by nature. And, and we shouldn't enjoy confrontation. But there is a sense in which sometimes confrontation is needed. So if you have your Bible, uh, let's look together at, at Galatians uh, chapter 2 and begin in verse 11. It says, when Cephas, and that's Peter, uh, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he used to eat with Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came... He withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. So what was going on was that, that Peter, right, the, and you all are familiar with Peter, the, the disciple, the follower of Jesus. He was the leader of the twelve. And, and, and Peter, of course, is, is bold, right? We, we, we find Peter always being bold. He's a bit brash sometimes. He, he is one who speaks sometimes before he thinks. But Peter was somebody who loved deeply, and he loved Jesus deeply. But we know that, that Peter one night failed Jesus deeply, right? That, that on the night before Jesus went to the cross, even after Jesus warned him, 
that he would fail, that he would deny that he even knew him. Peter did it anyway. And Peter was broken and, and heartbroken. He wept bitterly over his betrayal. But Jesus restored him. He forgave him. He recommissioned him to serve him. And Peter did. He preached boldly in Jerusalem about the gospel. God revealed to Peter that the gospel was for the Gentiles. And Peter went and he saw Gentiles saved, the Holy Spirit come upon them. And so Peter knew Jesus and he knew the gospel and he loved Jesus. And he wanted everyone to know about Christ. But Peter was human, and Peter, like us, sometimes failed, even after being forgiven and restored. And so we're going to find here that, that what is going on is that, that Peter was there, and he would enjoy meals with Gentiles, which Jews did not do. But now that he'd come to know faith in Christ, fellowship, meals could be shared with anyone. And not only is the context you're just talking about a casual dinner, but these were meals where believers came together to fellowship and to encourage one another. And usually at these meals, they would share the Lord's Supper. They would take communion together. And so this is a big deal because notice what happened. It said when certain Jews right, came from, from, from James, it says he withdrew and separated himself because he feared them. And so fear is causing Peter to act like a hypocrite. Right, because of his fear of what people will think, of what people will say, of what people might do, Peter says he changed his behavior, and instead of eating with his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, he now stopped fellowshipping them. He stopped interacting with them. And so Paul, when he saw this, he says, this cannot be. This is wrong. This is, this is in contradiction to the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel means not only am I forgiven of my sin, not only do I have a relationship with Christ, not only am I adopted into his family, redeemed, not only am I an heir of his glory, but now I am related to everyone who comes to know Christ. Right? That they're now my brothers and sisters, that I have a unique relationship with every other Christian, with every other believer in this world. Right? We have a unique bond because we have the same, same father. Right? We, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so Paul had to confront this issue. And I imagine that confronting Peter was not easy. And I imagine that, that even though Paul was a bold and confident person, I'm sure he didn't want to do this, but he needed to do this, and he did it publicly. And you know, Peter's fears, they actually were valid. Right, his fears of what that people would say things about him, that people might do things to him. Remember Paul, in fact, he will end this letter if you, as we get to the end of Galatians. He'll say, I, my body bears the marks of following Jesus. You see, Paul had been beaten. He had been whipped for his faith in Christ. Right? He, he, is, he has suffered for following Jesus. And so for whatever reason in this situation, Peter has given in to fear, fear of man. Remember, we talked about being people pleasers yesterday, and Paul said, we cannot live for the applause of people, but rather only Christ. And so, notice what happens as this confrontation goes on. Verse 13, it says, then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? And so uh, Paul is very, very straightforward in his confrontation, isn't he? Right? Do you notice that he says straight up, he says, you are being hypocrites. And not only, Peter, are you being a hypocrite, but you are leading others. Notice what it says, that the other Jews who are followers of Jesus joined his hypocrisy. You know, it's easy sometimes when somebody that you look up to is doing something to follow along. And no doubt, these other believers, they looked up to Peter. I mean, he was Peter after all. He was the one who had been with Jesus, who traveled with Jesus, like who saw the miracles in the ministry, who, who encountered the risen Christ. And so they were following Peter, but Peter was leading them into hypocrisy. To be a hypocrite means to know something that's true, to believe something to hold something dearly, but to live and to act opposite of your beliefs and your convictions. Now, being a hypocrite isn't sometimes failing or stumbling or falling, sometimes doing what you wished you didn't do. That's, that's being normal. But being a hypocrite is acting contrary 
to what you know is true and what you believe. Living one way in some situations and another way in other situations. And many of us have had that experience. And for me, in my, my journey with Christ, there were times that I was a hypocrite. And especially when I was your age. Because I struggled with wanting to fit in. I struggled with what people would say or what people might do. And so there were times that I acted unlike a Christian in order to fit in. And Paul, as he writes this letter, says, that cannot be. And so he says, this, this hypocrisy is carrying so many people away. And he says, here's the issue with your hypocrisy. You're deviating from the truth of the gospel. Remember, for Paul, the primacy of the gospel was everything. And he says, you, by, by doing this, you are denying the truth of the good news of the gospel of Christ. So he says, I told Cephas, look at verse 14, in front of everyone, right, publicly, if you were a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, right? He says, Peter, you, you, you no longer strictly follow the, the ceremonial laws of Judaism because you've been set free. And so why would you, who live that way, now compel Gentiles to live like Jews? Look at verse 15. We Jews, we are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that no one is justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. And so in his confrontation, Paul takes Peter and these others back to the heart of the issue. Right? And the heart of the issue is this, that... that Faith in Christ, justification, being made right with God, only happens one way. Notice he says that no one is justified by the works of the law. That, that you cannot earn a relationship with God. You cannot be good enough to deserve a relationship with God. That it, it's not our works, it's not our goodness, it's not our pedigree or our performance that earns us a relationship with God. He says we believed in Christ. We put our faith and our trust in Him. So that we can be justified. Sorry, I'm having so much trouble with this thing. I hope it's not distracting you. <clears throat> it's distracting to me. Anybody get distracted easily? All right. Now you're all distracted with me. Great. <clears throat> Paul says, Paul says, we're only justified by faith. Right? This is a foundational doctrine. This is a foundational truth of what it means to follow Christ and know Christ. He says, we have believed, we put our faith, that we're justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. Why? Because by works of the law, no one, no human being, will be justified. Only through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, because of this, right, some were, some were accusing Paul of saying, well, you're just saying that people can do whatever they want to do. But notice what Paul says. He deals with that argument, verse 17. He says, but if, while seeking to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found to be sinners, is Christ then a promoter of sin? Absolutely not. For if I rebuild those things that I tore down, I show myself to be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I have died to the law, that I might live to God. And so Paul deals with this argument. He says, no, Jesus fulfilled the law for us. The law was not bad. The law wasn't the problem. Right? The problem was that none of us could keep the law. Right? And, and God never intended for the law to be the means by which anyone was saved. The law, and Paul will make this argument, was there to be a constraint, to show the people of God how to live as the people of God in their world and in their culture. But it was also to be something that showed them their sinfulness and their need of a Savior. Paul would argue later that it's to be a schoolmaster that would lead us to Christ. And so... As he deals with this issue, he says, I'm not promoting sin. In fact, he says, once you taste the grace of God, once you experience the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you don't want to go back to live a life of sin. You don't want to, to disobey Christ. You want to know him and you want to follow him. And so he says, I've died to the law that I might live to God. Now, I want to get to his testimony. And, and, and this is really personal for me. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And the reason this verse very personal to me is because I first really heard this verse and, and its implications while I, was a, while I was a student here at Chehi. And I was privileged, I'm old enough to know one of our founders, right? Chehi was founded by a couple named Wilmus 
and Gladys Chafee. And I'm so thankful for them, for their vision, for the burden that God gave them to start this ministry that's impacted me and you and so many others. But Gladys Chafee uh, was still living when I was a student. She was here. She played the cowbells, and I all wish you all could have heard her play the cowbells. It was an amazing sight and experience. But she had a verse, it was Galatians 2.20, that she called her life verse, and she quoted it all the time. And I can still hear her quoting it. In fact, the first time I remember her quoting it was actually in the foyer uh, outside of Chatless. And so I can picture that to this day, 27 years later. And she said this, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so this is Paul's testimony. And as he's having this confrontation with Peter, right, where he gets up in his face, right? How many of you say that's pretty intense, isn't it? Right? And you can just imagine Paul and Peter face to face. And they're doing this in public because Peter was leading the whole church, the Jewish followers there, to sin by being hypocrites. And so Paul has this confrontation. And he says, this isn't right. You're being hypocrites. And, and, and it, I didn't highlight this, but he said even Barnabas, who had a passion to see the gospel go to the Gentiles, was being led astray by Peter's hypocrisy. And so as Paul's confronting this, and he's, he's pointing them to justification by faith and why, why they are wrong to be doing what they're doing, he then shares this testimony, and he, and he wants them, and Paul would want you, and he would want me to know his testimony. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. He says, when, when Christ died on the cross, Paul was there. Paul's sins were there. And he says, I, I now, I've been crucified with Christ. And that's, that's an extraordinary thing to say because crucifixion meant absolutely giving up. Your, you, were, you had no rights when you were being led to crucifixion. You had no say over your life anymore. In fact, you were condemned. You were sentenced to death. You had to carry your own cross. And you were going to a certain and sure death. And so Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Paul said, I used to live for me. I used to live for my, my glory. I used to live for my purposes. And I thought I was living for God, but I wasn't. But once I met Christ, everything changed. And when everything changed, Paul says, I now realize that life isn't about me. It's about Christ. He says, I've been crucified with Christ, but I, and I no longer live. But I'm alive. And he says, I'm alive because Christ lives in me. Right? He says, I've got a brand new life. The God of the universe now lives inside of me. And I live this life in the flesh. How? By faith. He says, I trust him. I trust him. It's not always easy. It's not always safe. Sometimes it's cost me, it's cost me nearly to the point of my life. But he says, I live by faith in the Son of God. Why? Because he loved me and he gave himself for me. Notice that he says love in the past tense. Now, Paul knew that Jesus currently loved him. But he highlighted the fact that Paul realized that, that Christ loved him when he did not deserve it. Christ loved him when he was far from him. And it was that love that changed his life. And I want every single one of you to know the depth of God's love for you. You know, it's often been said that the time that we need love the most is when we deserve it the least. And I hope that you can have a, a memory of some time where someone showed you love when you didn't deserve it. Because when someone shows you love when you, didn't, when you don't deserve it, it's so powerful. And God demonstrated his love towards you and towards me that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that love changed everything for Paul. It, it, it made all of the difference in his life. And it can make all the difference in your life and in my life as well. When you know the depth of his love for you, when you say, I am, I am so loved by God, I'm so loved that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I didn't deserve that. And Paul said, I know I didn't deserve it. I know I didn't earn it, but God gave it to me freely, and it's changed me. right? And I have a new purpose, a new passion. The old life is gone. I've been crucified with Christ, but I still live. In fact, Paul would say, I am more alive than I ever was. And my passion now isn't for me, but it's for Christ and for his glory and for his kingdom and for the gospel. And so he says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And he loved me not just in word, but he loved me in action. He gave 
himself for me. Look at verse 21. So Paul says, I don't, do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Right? Paul had such a passion for the gospel because he says the gospel is everything. The night that Jesus, the night before Jesus went to the cross, as he went to the garden and he prayed, as he began, began to take on the weight of what was about to happen, the weight of bearing the the evil of sin in his own body, the weight of experiencing the horror of the physical suffering that he was about to go through as he prayed to his father. He begged his father to take the cup of judgment from him. He begged his father. He said, Father, if there's any other way that you can accomplish your will, if there's any other way, then take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And the Father, who always lived in perfect relationship with the Son, in perfect harmony, and in the most perfect love, knew that there was no other way. And Jesus knew there was no other way. But he was expressing his humanity and the way that it was about to happen. And if there was any other way for us to be made right with God, whether it was by keeping the law, or just by being a good person, or by having any sort of faith or belief, or if there were many paths to God, then the cross was the most cruel thing that God ever could have imagined. Why would he allow his son to go to that cross, to be mocked and humiliated, to be tortured and tormented? Why would he allow him to bear the weight of evil and sin if it was not necessary? But Paul knew it was necessary. There was no other way. And so his passion now is for the gospel. And so this morning, as we think about, okay, so what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us? Paul would want us to, to know that the gospel is primary. Don't abandon the gospel. There are so many philosophies and so many thoughts. And yes, we have questions, and it's fine to have questions. And we have doubts, and it's okay to have doubts. But Paul would say, in your questions and in your doubts, always go back to the cross. Because there you'll find the God who loved you and gave himself for you. And there you'll find the only means for salvation. And he would say, cling to that. But not only that, he would call us to live and step with the gospel. And so I want to ask, this is one of the pointless messages, all right? So I just have a question instead of points. But here's my question. Am I living in step with the gospel? This is the question that I want you to wrestle with this morning. Am I living in step with the gospel? You know, I shared a little bit earlier in this message that that when I was in high school, I really struggled with how to live out my faith. Right? I struggled with that. And, and at church and at home, I was a very good Christian, mostly. But at school, I wanted to fit in. And so in my actions and in my words, I was a hypocrite. And when I came here, God began to convict me about that. And God began to show me who I was. He began to show me my identity in Christ. He began to show me and help me to understand the gospel that had saved me, but the gospel that needed to change me and transform me. And God convicted me that I was not walking in step with the gospel. And God, God began to change my heart and my desire. And, and, and I'll share a little bit more about this later, but by the end of camp, I also felt God calling me to be a pastor, to be in ministry. And I just thought that was the craziest thing because I knew I didn't deserve that. I didn't think I had the ability to do that. And, and for a long time, I, I ran away from that. But I want you to know that what God did for me, I believe God can do for you. And maybe, maybe you were like Peter. And you say, you know what? I'm compromising in an area of my life. You know, whether it's fear or some other reason, Peter compromised his faith by refusing to eat with his brothers and sisters in Christ, by refusing to share life with them, by, by refusing to have communion with them. He was, he was being a hypocrite, and he was compromising his faith. And maybe, maybe that's not the issue, but maybe you say, you know, there, there's an area of my life that I am, I am compromising. And maybe God has brought you here to convict you of that. And he convicts us because he loves us. He convicts us because he has a good plan for your life. And he wants to bring you back to himself. Right? We know from the evidence of history that, that Peter responded well to this review. 
Right? He went on to continue to serve God, to write scripture. But not only was it Peter, but it was Barnabas and the others, right, who got led away. And maybe you've gotten sucked into other people's lives that are pulling you away from the gospel. And they're causing you to be a hypocrite. You didn't intend to be a hypocrite. You don't want to be a hypocrite. But you say, you know, if I'm honest, maybe I am. And so I just, I just want to invite, you know, there's a tendency for us to drift away from the gospel. And so I want to invite you to wrestle with and to think about this question. To, to not just think about it right now, but think about it throughout the day. To pray over it. And to ask the Holy Spirit to say, is there an area of my life? Maybe, maybe say, I don't even need to ask the Holy Spirit. I know right now. Right? God's, God's speaking that to me. But if not, say, am I living in step with the gospel? And I want to close with, with this verse from the book of Romans, also written by Paul. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Right? God has a good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life. And Paul says, don't, don't, don't follow the pattern of this age or this world, the philosophies and the beliefs of, that, are, that are contrary to the gospel. But he says instead, allow your mind to be renewed in the truth of who God is, of the gospel. And let that lead you to God's good and perfect will for your life. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this new day that you've given us. I thank you for your grace and your mercy that you have offered us once again. Father, I thank you for your word that's living and powerful and true. I thank you that, that you have preserved it for us and that through your word we can encounter your presence, your truth, and your love for us. And Father, I just pray for each person here today, each student, each counselor, each faculty, each staff member, for myself, that we would wrestle with this question of whether or not we are living in step with the gospel. And Father, I pray that if there's an area that we have compromised in, if there's an area where we have begun to be a hypocrite in, Father, I pray that you would convict us. I pray that you would bring us back to repentance and restoration. Father, I thank you that you are always willing to forgive and to restore and to recommission us to serve you. So, Father, I pray that, that we would not be afraid to run to you, knowing that you will accept us, forgive us, and restore us. And, Father, I ask your blessing over this day. I pray for all that will take place in rehearsals and in lessons and practice, in fun, in meals together. I just pray that in all of that, we would encounter your presence, that we would experience your joy, and have a wonderful day. We ask your blessing over it in Jesus' name. Amen.